you, Daniel. Beautiful. Beautiful invitation. Powerful. What a powerful prayer. Really, that's the heart of our faith. Thank you for that prayer, for the heart of our faith. God, we thank you. You invite us to remember who we are. To not let this world define us or shame us or minimize us. You invite us to live in the fullness of belovedness. Remind us again and again of who we are in you. Remind us that we are called to abundance and generosity and fullness and to courage. Help us to be a people of courageous faith. And now God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be in alignment with your love and who you are and who you invite us to be. Amen. We're excited about our current series, Courageous Faith, How to Rise and Resist in a Time of Fear. It's inspired by an amazing, truly engaging book by E. Carrington Heath. They are a pastor of a UCC congregation in New Hampshire. Their pronouns are they, them. And it's a book that's very challenging. I'll be just reading a brief excerpt from it in a few moments. This series will continue up to Pride when we begin a new series. And then we're going to pick this series back up in the fall heading into the election because we're going to need some courage and some courageous faith heading into uh, the election, whatever the outcome uh, might be, and the outcomes might be in various locales. This week we're looking at Luke's version of the story we heard last week. Last week was John's version. And one thing the stories have in common is that Jesus enters right into the midst of people who are scared out of their wits. Jesus moves into the room and says, peace be with you. It's offered in John's gospel as well as today in Luke's gospel. Jesus enters into that very room. They were people who were afraid of ending up crucified like Jesus. They were people who felt powerless before Rome. Peace be with you. Now what's interesting in this week's passage is they were so afraid they really didn't hear what Jesus was saying, at least not initially. It says that in their panic and fright, they thought they were seeing a ghost. <laughs> not only could they not hear what Jesus was saying, not only could they re not receive it, they thought they were seeing a ghost. This points to the way that fear can cause a loss of perspective. And they were having this loss of perspective in the scripture. Jesus sees what they're going through and he asks a couple of questions. Jesus says, why are you disturbed? Why do such ideas cross your mind? Why do you think I'm a ghost? And then Jesus draws them back to tangible reality when Jesus says, look at my hands and my feet. It is I. Really. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as I do. And after saying this, Jesus showed them his wounds. We're going to talk more about this in a moment, but I want to point out now, this is a, a really important moment because it shows that resurrection does not erase the wounds of Jesus. And in this moment when Jesus extends his hands, he's being vulnerable and sharing his wounds. Again, we're going to talk more about the importance of this in a few moments. As the scripture continues, they were in disbelief from joy and they were also in amazement. Disbelief and amazement alongside each other. And then Jesus asked them another question that draws them back to reality. Jesus says, do you have anything here to eat? Jesus is hungry like a real person because Jesus is a real person. And after being given a piece of broiled fish, so specific, Jesus ate in their presence. I'm trying to imagine that moment. Are they also eating? I think they're a little too amazed and shocked to eat. I, I think they're sitting around looking at Jesus eating and just going, wow, is this really happening? Jesus says, peace be with you. 
All that's going on, Jesus says, peace be with you. And ultimately, that peace begins to settle on them. And here's an important distinction in this week's scripture. It's not Jesus' intention for them to be just sitting around comfortable in their peace. The invitation of Jesus is for that peace to be an entryway into power and an entryway into courage. Jesus says something so amazing and powerful here when he calls them to courageous faith. Jesus says, go into all the nations and preach love and forgiveness. Love and forgiveness. Do we ever need that today? And it's going to take courage to deliver it. Jesus says to the disciples, you are witnesses. You've seen me eat. You've seen me in your presence. You are witnesses. So take note, I am sending forth what God has promised to you. Remain here in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. Peace becomes a peaceful power. Not a violent power, but a peaceful power. And we, MCCDC, are called to be a church of peaceful power. Moving beyond our walls into the city and beyond with power not from ourselves, but from on high. MCCDC, what courage do we need? What courageous faith are we called to? First of all, if you look at the scripture, we're called for the courage to wait on the Spirit's power. Now, now this seems a little counterintuitive. There are urgent needs, and yet Jesus is talking about waiting. Jesus says, wait here in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. Question, does waiting take courage? I think it does. Sometimes we're so compelled, we become impulsive and we reach out without having our resources together to make a positive difference. It takes courage to trust that in the waiting there will be a strengthening that could be so important. There's a, humil there's a humility here. This acknowledges that we need the power of the Holy Spirit to act with courage. If we try to just muster up courage on our own, we could probably cause damage. There's a call here to allow ourselves individually and as a congregation to be reshaped and renewed and recasted. Stephen Doughty says, the Holy Spirit has never ceased attempting to recast who we are and how we live in our communities of faith. The Spirit comes from the realm of utter, utter wholeness and perpetually seeks to draw us there. In other words, it's important that we ensure that we have the equipment that we need to move out in courage. It invites us to take that time to grow as community and to mature. Now there's a real both and here. Sometimes we can be waiting on one hand and moving on the other, doing the next right thing while continuing to grow in the process. Well think about that. Think about the courage to wait and then to move forward. It's an important point that Jesus makes. And now comes the real call to courage beyond the waiting. It's the courage to enter places of pain and need. Jesus invites those early disciples to turn outward to the world's needs. Jesus invites them ultimately to move beyond the room where they were hiding. Jesus invites them and us to open themselves and ourselves to the poor, the forgotten, and the pained. Some ways to do this, first of all, is through serious study. And that's what the spiritual engagement hour is going to be partly about. In our church growth model, we're looking at attracting, including maturing, and mobilizing. And this maturing, this growing, this deep study is an important part of what we're called to do. There are deep needs which requires deep preparation. We're going to engage in programs that reach the wider community. It's also part of the reimagining that we're doing. Generous giving is a big part of going into the world to make that positive difference, which we seek to do 
through resources and the share card and being a community that listens and opens ourselves and we're not doing it alone. I love this invitation to go into the nations and our partnership with UFMCC is about going in to the nations around the world and drawing on the strength. The courage to enter places beyond our walls and this room to do this work through our online ministries and beyond. When we enter places of pain and need, we look to Jesus and his pain. So we go back to that point in our scripture today where Jesus showed his wounds, risen yet wounded. What's powerful about this is that we are called to be wounded healers just as Jesus was. We too, like Jesus, can be alive and resurrected and out of the tomb, yet continue to need the courage to face our wounds and our pain. And this is hard work and just important work. One thing at MCCDC that we've done over the past year is to really destigmatize mental health issues, destigmatize addictions, that we can learn together as community. It takes courage to ask for help, and that is part of our call as a congregation. This is where I want to draw on uh, this wonderful teacher, E. Carrington Heath. In their book, they point to the story of Jesus, where Jesus tells about two people who each build a house. One builds a house on sand, and one builds a house on rock. The house built on sand is blown away very easily. Again, this goes back to the waiting and the resourcing that Jesus is talking about a little bit earlier. The other house is built on the rock, and that house is strong, and it stands. Now, this is what E. Carrington Heath, who we call Pastor M, tells about this story and how it impacts their life. They write, The greatest gift sobriety gave to me was knocking down my house. In admitting that my life had become unmanageable, I was able to get honest about the parts of my life that had been built on sand. Dismantling those parts of the house was painful and frustrating. Rebuilding them was challenging. In the end, I found that the solid foundation of rock bottom, the bedrock of God's love and grace, became the anchor of my being. When denial keeps us from seeing that our house is on, built on sand, we become convinced that we do not need to change anything. When we are shaken by the winds and rain of reality, though, that crisis can convince us to rebuild again, this time on solid ground. That kind of rebuilding and change is not easy, but it is life-saving. In recovery, we call our rock-bottom moments the gift of desperation. Things are so bad that we are ready to try something new, and we are ready to change. Jesus was calling those early disciples to move out of that room where they were shaking in their fear, that place of desperation, and to renew their lives with growth and with rebuilding and with courage. And that too becomes our call to look in our own lives and see where we need to grow and change that we can live with resurrected courage and hope and freedom and strength. And just important that we work on ourselves while reaching out to others. And this is where Richard Rohr comes in. He said something that I've never forgotten. He said, if we do not transform our pain, we will most assuredly transmit it. If we do not transform our pain, we will most assuredly transmit it. Jesus was calling those early disciples to work on themselves and then to share their new lives with others. And the same thing for us. We are called to work as a congregation on our spiritual maturity. We're called to work as a congregation to heal ourselves as we seek to reach out and heal the world. And then from a place of wholeness, we can respond to the call of Jesus where Jesus says, I was hungry and you fed me. I had no clothes and you clothed me. I was in prison and you met me there. I was sick and you came to me with gifts of wholeness. 
Oh, our vision is to be whole people sharing these gifts of wholeness through the courage and the power of the Holy Spirit. We are called to put courageous faith in practice. And I can believe we can do the hard work to get there. We can make the tough choices. We can address conflict. We can work together. And all of this is only possible not by our own strength, but from the power on high that Jesus bestowed on those first disciples and now bestows on us. Courageous faith is doing something too big to be done alone. And we're called to do things that are too big for any of us to do individually, too big for us to do alone. We need the Holy Spirit and we need each other. We need community to multiply our faith. Imagine what it means to be courageous, to do the hard work of courage. And imagine how our church will grow as we release ourselves into God's eternal power. We have the power to be a people of courageous faith, to make a positive difference in this world. Yes, even this world. Amen and so it is. Amen.